Three people died in the woods last summer, and I'm not sure if I can tell anyone the truth about it. Part 2. A story by user isolated destination. We rushed into the living room of a small, nearly pitch black, dusty cabin. The door slammed behind us, and the women locked it. She immediately started pushing a large dresser in front of the frail back door. Don't say a word. She shot at us. I wanted to explain what we had just gone through, but I had a feeling I didn't really have to. My cousins and I closed in and without thinking, were all huddled together in the middle of the room. A minute went by, and we heard nothing. I know what you've seen, the woman broke the silence with, they have been out there every night. We stood in confusion. We hadn't really seen anything but were still processing the shock of what we had just experienced. What is going on, we need help, please, something was chasing us. I started to plead, but the woman raised her hand to her mouth and again told me to be quiet. She whispered, look, I know you are confused, I know you are scared, but for the love of God please don't say another word. They have visited here three nights in a row now, and so far have not found a way in. They are smart, they can open doors and climb really well, they'll lose interest, but we have to stay quiet. We were frozen. My mind was racing and I couldn't think straight. I felt like everything that was happening was just happening to someone else. This could not be happening to me, this didn't make any sense. Then we heard something, outside, it sounded far away, banging, loud, pounding. It seemed to be coming from where we had left our car. They're here, the woman said. Stay still and don't make a sound. We immediately sat down on the floor. The banging continued followed by howling and hooting. The cries got louder as the banging stopped, and then we heard the sound of something running. Footsteps loud at first, but that seemed to get softer the closer they got to the cabin. Almost like whatever was outside was tiptoeing, or trying to be quiet. I looked at the woman. It was dark, but she was now sitting next to us and I could see an outline of her face by the scant moonlight that was coming in from the skylight above. Her eyes were squeezed shut, and her mouth pursed. She looked terrified. I heard the creaking of the wooden porch steps first, bending under something's weight before I heard any footsteps themselves. Whatever was climbing on the porch was quiet, but seemingly heavy. The steps continued around the deck that hugged the side of the cabin. More creaking followed, it sounded like there were three or four bodies moving around outside. I heard heavy breathing, followed by an occasional snort. Something was sniffing the walls of the cabin, following a scent that led directly to the flimsy back door that we had entered through. The dresser now standing in front of the door seemed as strong as a piece of paper, like nothing at all stood between us and whatever was on the outside of that door. I heard the handle start to shake. It was trying to open the door. The door was looked, but the vigorous shaking continued, almost like the creature thought if it shook long enough it would open, like it was testing the handle to try and figure out how it worked. The shaking stopped, followed by scratching, long, fast scratches. That sounded like it was trying to dig at the small bend in the frame that I had noticed earlier. I could hear the plastic and metal frame of the door giving and bending, but the door remained shut. Then the sound of a low growl outside, followed by a scuffle. It sounded like two of the things were fighting. We heard them tussle around the porch, and then their bodies slam into the side of the cabin wall. More howling, so loud I had to cover my ears, and then silence. I looked up in the dark. Are they gone? Sloane whispered, but the women just shook her head and put a finger to her mouth. Trinity was shaking. I was too. It was so quiet, I started to stand up, but the woman grabbed me and mouth without a saying word don't move. Suddenly loud, intense banging came from every side of the cabin. The walls and shelves inside seemed to actually rattle and shake from the slamming, and pounding, screeching outside. I wanted to scream so badly, it was unbearable. The woman had one hand across Trinity's mouth, and one across Sloane's and before I could let a noise out, she mothered to me don't scream. I covered my own moth to keep from making a noise. The pounding was going on for what felt like an hour, and then slowly started to stop. Outside on the porch it sounded like a stampede was taking off, no longer trying to be quiet we could hear the loud, clobbering footsteps of what had to be at least five or six of those things, running off and away from us. No one dared make a sound. It felt like hours later, but really was probably only 10 to 15 minutes. The woman stood up and walked over to peer through a small peephole in the front door, 
the only window to the outside world aside from the skylight in the ceiling. Okay, she whispered, they are gone for real now, you can stand up and sit on the couch, it's a lot more comfortable than the floor. The three of us looked at each other. What is happening? Trinity wailed, what is going on, please, we need to find our aunt. She's missing. I wish I could tell you, the woman started, I am probably more confused than you are. We started to stand up and move over to the couch. Here this will keep you warm and help you relax, the woman said handing us a large blanket. What do you know? I interrupted. I was now starting to fully process all that had just happened, and knew the woman had more information than we did. Keep your voice down, I'll tell you everything, but we can't be too loud. Sometimes they come back, just to check out the house again. They are incredibly smart. They set traps and they know how to even trick people. She began to tell us. It started about a week ago. Was it a week? I don't really know, more than three to four days. My two best friends and I take a trip together every year. We found an amazing deal online for a cabin, by a lake, I mean it seemed too good to be true. We booked it and were only given an address. I listened to her story. I remembered that the same thing had happened to my aunt. She had also booked the cabin after finding it online. The woman continued, it seemed fine at first. We all piled into my friend's car. We drove up here okay and spent the first night together. It was like all our vacations, lots of laughter and joy. The woman's eyes were slightly glistening in the darkness. It looked like there were tears starting to well up. The first thing we noticed was on the second day. We were leaving to head out on a hike when we saw something on the front of the porch. It was rabbit, or large possum, I think, still not really sure but it was completely torn to shreds. Like, all that was there was blood and fur. The strangest part about it was that there was no blood leading to or from the corpse, like the entire attack had taken place right on the spot on the front porch, and yet we hadn't heard a thing all night. Now, this cabin is small, it's not like the sound of a predator attacking and eating something right outside our door would escape us. We would have heard something. Also, it seemed really unusual that a bear or mountain lion would just kill and eat something so close to a house, usually they like to be more secluded when they eat their prey. She continued to talk in a low whisper. And the strangest thing of all was the amount of blood. I mean, I grew up hunting, I know how to bleed a carcass, and there is no way an animal that size would leave that large of a pool of blood. It just made no sense. We were all a little shock up, but we grew up in the country. We weren't about to stop enjoying our vacation because something killed a small animal near our cabin. It would take a lot more than that to scare us. We decided to continue our hike around the lake. There's a small rowboat that came with the cabin and we wanted to bring some beers and take it out for a spin. Well, we were enjoying ourselves a little too much and were out on the lake while the sun started to set. It was dusk, and we decided we didn't want to be out on the lake after dark, and we started to head back, rowing towards shore. The woman looked down, and put her hand over her face. She was sobbing. I should have listened to her. My friend Haley stopped us as we were rowing, she was hysterical, she said she saw something, a few hundred feet out on the shore. She begged us to slow down, and pull the boat up to a different part of the shore. She said while we were goofing around, just singing and rowing back she saw something sitting on the shore, watching us. Not like a bear that's just minding its business, and notices some people, but that this thing she saw was almost peering at us from behind a tree, following us with its head before it jumped back into the woods. We didn't believe her. We could tell she was stunned, and that something was wrong, but we told her she was acting crazy. Told her she had drunk a little too much more than she could handle, we kept rowing towards the shore, laughing, not worrying about anything. And she seemed to start believing us that maybe what she had seen was just in her head. We weren't afraid because we knew there's nothing really dangerous out here, the bears around here don't attack people. And even if one was hanging around and had eaten the rabbit on the porch it was probably more interested in our granola bars than us. The woman took another deep breath and continued her story. We pulled up to the shore, me and my other friend, Stephanie were laughing, talking about what we would eat for dinner but could tell that Haley was still on edge and approached the shore nervously, looking around as we pulled the small boat onto land. It happened so fast, we didn't hear a sound. 
I can't really describe what I saw other than it seemed like it came down from the sky. It dropped from the air over Haley and draped its body around her, then instantly seemed to shoot up back in the air, landing a few hundred feet away. Out of the woods seven of eight other creatures just like it emerged, all leaping over to where the other thing had landed. They started devouring her, we couldn't watch, but it seemed like they went into a frenzy and were more focused on attacking and fighting each other instead of our friend. We ran inside the cabin, I know it was a cowardly thing to do, but I felt like my instincts took over. We left her. We didn't even try to help. You think you will be brave in a situation like that but we just left her. We didn't know what to do, we hid in here, we didn't sleep a second that night. The woman was crying now, trying to sob as quietly as possible. The next morning, we decided to leave. We didn't pack anything. We waited until the coast was completely clear and stepped outside. It was around noon and when we got into the car to leave we realized that Haley had had the keys. We walked to where she had been attacked. There was nothing. Just blood. So much blood you can't imagine. Some of it must have come from the creatures themselves. It seemed like they would go into a frenzy and attack each other. Maybe they even eat each other, I am not sure. We saw no sign of the keys or anything but blood. Stephanie wanted to make a run for it. She reasoned that both attacks had happened at night and that they probably slept during the day. That if we left now we could run for help before it got dark. I couldn't bring myself to leave. I went back into the house, she pleaded with me to go, but I just couldn't. I let her leave all on her own, and I have been here ever since. It's been four days since she left. I am just about all out of food. Those creatures return every night, looking for me. And I still don't know what to do, or how to get out of here. She started crying again, and I looked at my cousins. Everyone looked terrified, in shock, and most of all, sad. We need sleep, I replied. I don't know what we are going to do, but I know that we can't do anything tonight. Everyone seemed to nod in agreement. I sleep on the floor, away from the walls, the woman said. Sometimes they bang on the walls in the middle of the night, I think they are trying to startle to me, to see if they can hear someone inside. Let's all lay together in the middle of the floor, on the mattresses, Sloan suggested. We set pulled three twin mattresses from the other room, a bedroom with no windows that the women had apparently boarded off by tipping a refrigerator in front of the only door into it. We moved quickly, and quietly, and laid the mattresses on the ground together, sharing a couple blankets. I closed my eyes. I was equally exhausted, as I was full of nervous energy. I knew I need sleep, but I also did not want to slip into unconsciousness. My exhaust took over and I fell finally fell asleep. It was poor sleep, as I tossed and turned, waking up several times from nightmares where I saw a faceless creature reaching for me, seeing only the clawed hands that had tried to grab me earlier in the bronco. I dozed in and out of my slumber for a few hours, the night seemed to go on for eternity. I felt something grabbing me, shaking my arm. Another nightmare coming on, I told myself and tried to fight the sensation to get some more rest. But this wasn't in my dreams. This was happening in the real world. Something was squeezing my forearm, tightly, subtly shaking me awake, and digging nails deep into my skin. I jerked awake to see what had me, but it was just Trinity, lying next to me on the mattress. Her hand was grabbing my arm so tightly I was about to yell at her to stop, but she wasn't looking at me. She was looking straight. Her eyes were tightly locked directly above her towards the ceiling. She said nothing. I looked up to see what she was staring at. Two eyes met mine through the window in the inner roof above us. A face, too dark to make out was peering through the skylight. I couldn't see more than an outline, but one thing was impossible to miss. Glowing, red eyes, were examining the contents of the room and had stopped its search right on the four of us, all lying on the floor. I didn't move, but it was too late. The creature had seen me, all of us, just lying there. Instantly it flew out of view, and we could hear it scurrying, crawling to the edge of the roof. It stood still for a few seconds before letting out a loud, piecing, howl. That is the second part of this story. What really happened to the body of Haley after she were attacked by these unnamed creatures? Was there really a man peering at the group of Haley during their rowing on the lake? And the question still stands, who is the woman who helped Max and his cousins? Where is her another companion, Stephanie? To know more on what will happen next to this story, 
make sure to share and subscribe to this channel, and turn on the notification bell so you won't miss the updates from us. And also, kindly like and share this video, and comment down below on what you think about this story, or any theories boggling your mind. This is the Double Dutchman, thank you for tuning in on our story, and we'll see you on the next part.